Hello and a very warm welcome to yet another edition of The Real Talk. It is always such a pleasure to have your company. My name is Jackie Lumbasi and I have an amazing guest for us today. Now over the last few weeks we have been talking to different people, getting to hear their experiences and life lessons, inspiration and we have touched a lot on the genocide against the Tutsi as we mark Kuiwuka 30. And then a thought came to mind, you know, all the people we've talked to have dealt with life differently. They've mm -hmm. dealt with this tragedy and its impact differently. How about we bring somebody who's going to speak to every one of us and not just about what we went through in 1994, but what we go about, we go through today, what we could go through tomorrow. How do we deal with the blows that we get in life? Today, we have a coach and my goodness, you're not ready for what's coming your way. Welcome to The Real Talk. We're coming to you from Mythos Boutique Hotel. Our guest is a coach. Well, I would love to call her a coach, but no, let me accord her the right title. Mireya Carrera is the executive chairwoman and lead coach at Cora Coaching and Business Academy. Mm. You will get to know more about Mireya. Mireya, thank you for honoring our invitation. Thank you, Jackie, for having me. You're an amazing soul. Pleasure Aww. to see you. You know, I admire your work. Thank you. I've known you for I don't know how many years. For oh, many the radio years. years. You know. And I admire your work. I thank love you. what you do. And uh, you are truly a gifted communicator. Amen. Thank you so much. I thank God for that. And I am a great admirer of your work as well. Thank you. Thank you mm. for all the support that you give, not just to me, but to mm. the many people that you mm -hmm. interact with. Thank you yeah. for being the light that shines a lot on all of us. Thank you, Mireille. You're welcome. Would love to know more about you. Mm -hmm. And let's start where your life started. Let's go back to that place where you were born mm -hmm. and tell us about the family that you were raised in. Yes, wow. Yeah. Uh, you really want to go there from I the would beginning. Love to. Yes, yeah. from the beginning. All you know, right. there's always a genesis, huh? That is true. And that's where we want oh, to go. I love that word, the genesis. Yeah. So my beginnings were very humble. Uh, I was born in uh, 1976. Actually, I'm one of the few women that you know. Well, I don't shy away from telling my age, but do you know why? Because I look 12 years younger. Oh, yeah. that's what people oh. tell me. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't mind telling my age when I was born and my genesis as you said uh, that was in 1976 born abroad um, in the diaspora and specifically I was born in Burundi yeah. yes so um, and so when did your parents go to Burundi my parents went to Burundi that's an interesting one and I think mm. it's very much related to the topic of Kwebuka mm. Because I'm born, uh, obviously, from random parents, both my father and mother. Um, and my late father went to Burundi for school. Okay. And in 1955, 6, 7, 8, 9, uh, and he never returned. He never made it back to Rwanda. Um, and uh, because of that, um, it, what happened in 59, which culminating to obviously 1994, um, he saw himself not being able to return to his country and uh, as a teenager, uh, maybe I will talk about that a little bit later, and then he met my mother who was also there, born in Rwanda, they were both born in Rwanda, one in 46 and another in 56, 10 years apart, um, but my mother, her father, um, worked for the colonials, even my father's father worked for the Belgians mm -hmm. um, and the king, I will share that later, and, but they would travel Rwanda, Burundi, Congo, etc. And uh, my mother's father was on a mission in Burundi to help start what is known as Régie des Eaux, it's like today's Wasak. Mm -hmm. um, so it was established in Rwanda and then uh, Burundi. So he was on the mission. Um, in the 1958, she was two, I never returned mm -hmm. until 1993. But yeah. her father had passed yeah. away, obviously. Um, so my father and mother met in Burundi. Um, 
think they got married in 1972 because they were living in an area, I'm sure some of your audience will know in, uh, where Rwandans will live, it's called Ngagara, mm -hmm. that's the area, or Okaf, uh, which was predominantly settlers from the Rwandan diaspora in Burundi. So they found themselves being young, unable to return to their motherland mm -hmm. um, in 72, and then they got married. And uh, four it's kids settled, later, fully settled yeah, there, yeah. yeah, four kids later, I'm number four, uh, born in 76, and that's how I found myself in Burundi, yeah. um, schooled there, primary, and uh, the rest I'm sure will cover How that. were your school days, now that you, we've gotten there? Yeah. Going to school, and you know, I can imagine uh, the celebration at home when they're sending their last born to primary school. Mm. You've got to talk about your school time and shiny memories yeah. from uh, secondary yes. school, going Absolutely. to college. Yeah. Yes, and they were all in different countries. So, this mm. is the thing about our Such history. A well, sometimes life happens to you by choice or by force. Mm -hmm choice or force. I imagine yours was by force. Yeah. But then it became a choice. That's a key thing, okay. right? So that's where the yeah. coaching part comes in. But back to my, you know, early childhood. Uh, so yes, born in May 76. Um, then I was uh, given an opportunity to start school one year earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Not by choice, obviously, at a three or four, but maybe one thing I can share there with you with my very early humble uh, days was because we were refugees, we were in a you know, specific area. So at, by that time, I think it was 1978, 79, um, we, we went to, to school that was specific for random refugees. Mm -hmm. It's called Ecole Libre. Like uh, Ecole Libre. So, most of the people I'm sure behind the camera either have gone there. Mm. Um, I can safely guess that those who may have lived in, uh, in that country mm. in the 70s, 80s, probably, probably 60, studied. 70, 80 yeah. percent went to the same school. It was within uh, the, the camp or the settlement? It, well, it was in the city, like Kigali is a city or a town, but then in the area specifically, the school was built by UNHCR. Okay. Yes, so for Rwandan refugees. So probably, you know, 90% or 99% were Rwandan uh, mm -hmm. pupils there. And the, the one thing I wanted to share with you is that because it took time for that school to be built, I don't know why, I was just three or four, uh, to this day I've never asked why, but I guess they wanted to have children to be schooled sooner. Um, so we started in my in kindergarten in uh, and also in the primary school so we didn't have chairs yet so we will sit <laughs> on bricks <laughs> my dear we will sit on bricks my first school experience yes i was sat on a brick uh, one of those uh, brown bricks. and you'd have the book on your laps i don't well it That's was kindergarten books, for two years oh, okay. yeah. so i remember the That's primary really yeah so p1 was for sure we had uh, the infrastructure there already but it's amazing because that that's what my early childhood memory was and is mm. and i'm happy with that because yeah. when i now look at my uh former colleagues who are now in leadership positions uh we just laugh at those early mm. innocent days we didn't even know why why yeah. things were that way yeah i wonder yeah. when you became mm -hmm. of age and yes. you could understand your yes. surroundings and circumstances as a refugee what was your biggest struggle mm. maybe i would answer it this way with the word refugee itself because um as a child you don't know actually what what's going on and i remember vividly the space, I can visualize it now, where I was, the first time I heard that uh, phrase or term, refugee, in uh, Kinyarwanda or Kirundi, Imunzi. The f I, feel, I don't know, I don't remember exactly what words were being said, but we were in a classroom setting in Ecole Libre. I was in the fourth uh, P4 or, or uh, fourth class. And um, so, Clearly, we were majority Rwandans, so I'm sure kids were talking about Imunzi, refugee, refugee, but the taste it left in my mouth 
was a little bit of a bitter taste. So it, it was imprinted in me that that word, imonzi, mm. is not a good word. But I didn't understand actually the extent. So yeah, so just wanted to camp. Mm no pun intended, to camp on that word refugee, um, just to, to explain that I heard it for the first time there, um, but we were not specifically, you know, in a camp or so. But the impact would have been, you know, moving to different countries uh, by choice later on. It was wow. certainly by choice. And uh, it has a positive uh, outcome, I would even say, because um, when you're not in your country, yes, there are obviously negative ones, but the positive ones will be that you get to be exposed to different words. Um, but the negative impact for me, if I can just share, um, was that lack of knowing where I belong, the sense of belonging. And um, according to psychology, and I know you've heard of Abraham Maslow's you know, hierarchy of needs for human beings, um, of course, number one at the bottom is basics. It's food, shelter, security. But then after that, once you have eaten, once you have a place where you have, uh, where you can sleep, and of course we had that, then comes the social needs, the need to belong. To belong to a community, to belong to a family, to belong to a nation, to whatever. An identity. Right? Yeah. That's it. I yeah. Identity. So I didn't realize that then until probably when later on I went and lived um, in many parts, many continents uh, from 1994 onwards where I lived 20 years, yes, studies, etc., abroad. But later on I realized that actually there has to be a full circle for me to belong somewhere. Um, and that, that sense only came to me maybe 20 years after, and that was exactly in 2014, where through my work, I was seconded to work in Johannesburg in South Africa. And I remember that, yes, 94, we left Africa, 2014, I'm a full adult, I am a leader, I am given task, I am in Johannesburg. And because I had not lived in countries where I see black people in charge, black people work as a majority, because uh, I had gone to Europe, to the Middle East. Yeah. So in you my- You always belonged to the minority. There you go. So the minority, but now here I am 2014 in South Africa, majority is Africans and black. So I never thought it would be an issue at all because I've been able to assimilate really well everywhere by the grace of God. Uh, but psychologically, not belonging somewhere, that's where I realized that there was a hidden, I wouldn't even call it trauma, but there was a hidden uh, aspect of my life I forgot was actually important. So 2014, which led to why I now am in Rwanda, mm -hmm. um, that's what I thought I need to belong. I literally felt that as a, as a pull, as a, as a need, as a need, as an urge to be somewhere I can call a uh, home. I can call that I am one of them. I am one of them, they are part of me. And I never thought for 20 years I've been blessed with amazing careers in great countries. Different countries. Right? Yeah. But that was a hidden was somewhere. missing. Yes, yes. So that, that's maybe the main impact of not having a nation you call your own for a long time because you grow up thinking everything is okay. But there is that maybe the hidden trauma or hidden, whatever we want to call it, missing thing. Because remember I told you about my mom and dad. So I was supposed to have been born in 1976 in our southern district of Rohango because that's where my parents, my father comes from. Mm -hmm. So I've always wondered what life would have been like if you know, I had been born here in Rohango, in mm -hmm. Rohango right? Um, anyway, that's, oh that's, that's <laughs> one of that. How did you end up coming back home? So you have this realization yeah. and yeah huge discovery. Here I am, much as I'm blessed, traveled around the world, yeah. interacted with different people. I still don't know who I am. You're in Johannesburg, then that sets 
the pace and the grounds yeah. for you to come back home. How then did you end up back here? Yeah, I love the word. I'm very big with words. <laughs> I love the word you just used, discovery. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's linked to discovery, it's linked to identity, and later on, of course, it's linked to your purpose as to why you are here. So if you have your genesis, as you said, somewhere, mm -hmm. um, I'm sure there's got to be an end at some point. So um, in 2010, uh, that's where, while I was in Dubai, that's where I started thinking about why was I created Rwanda, even though I never lived in Rwanda? Why, and I was not even Rwandan by nationality. So uh, why was I created African, Rwandan, yet I had spent 20, almost 20 years abroad, um, outside of the continent. So that's where the self-discovery journey started for me, um, with a spiritual awakening in 2010, where I really started working on why am I here? What am I here to do? What's my purpose? Is life really just about making money, going to work, come back, have holidays, uh, get married, and then that's it? So that's what I thought. I, I started asking myself, why? What is my impact? So of course, when you are an employee, you co-create with your employer and you, uh, you serve. Uh, but I felt that there was something beyond just that for me, and I needed to discover what it was. So I started that journey of discovery, um, understanding whether my impact is greater or lesser where I was, or if my impact could become a little bit more. So therefore, um, I took some courses, I trained as a coach, and um, became certified, I started uh, to, as a coach while working in Dubai, training, mentoring, coaching already where I was uh, working. Um, and then later on, I realized that actually there was more. There was more for me to have an organization that I can lead, that can take me anywhere. Because oh. traveling is really part of my core values. Because I equate traveling with growth, with exposure. So um, that's where Cora came to be. Cora was first uh, founded in Dubai. Uh, parallelly from the work I was doing because, you know, I'm sure entrepreneurs will, will relate to this. I needed to plan uh, for a cushion of at least two years if, you know, if things go wrong, uh, at least I have that. So I kind of uh, worked it towards um, having a safety uh, while I, I jumped out of uh, employment into the comfort that comes Oh, my dear. <laughs> employment is comfortable. Very comfortable, Very but comfortable. employment is good, but yes. not no, it, the it, best. Totally, yeah. It, 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 it makes people sometimes lazy and... Uh, I, it's I, a yeah. journey. It's it a is journey. a journey. And you said it really well. It's a discovery journey. Mm. And also, I think people need to have the grace for themselves and uh, do things in your own time. Mm. Do things when you are ready. Um, and for me, I felt the timing was then in 2014 yeah. to jump. But yeah. then I jumped with two years of mitigation just in case yeah. things Planning. go wrong. That's you right. Yes. But it's a journey. You hadn't lived in the country. Then we had the genocide against the Tutsi. Over the last few weeks, I've been talking to different people yeah. about that, getting people's personal yeah. experiences. Mm -hmm. You were not around. Mm -hmm. I wonder. Did it affect you differently from how it impacted? Some of those I have talked to lost their family members, direct family, parents, siblings. Others lost distant relatives. There could be others that mm. didn't lose anyone close, but they still felt the impact. And I remember one of them saying, we mm. carry scars. Mm. Some could be visible, others invisible. I wonder what the impact was for you? Yeah, that's an interesting question, a very powerful one, because um, I think every Rwandan, Rwandan in the country or outside of the country was impacted in one way or another um, by the genocide. So my experience by no means is anywhere close to that of those who were in the country and that were physically affected by uh, but what happened in 94. But to your question about uh, relatives, certainly we had relatives. 
uh, maybe what I didn't share in my early uh, life is that we used to come to our uh, grandmother and grandfather's village mm -hmm. in Rohango. So I had been to Rohango in the late 80s. Yeah, in the 80s, I think the last time I had come to Rwanda to visit our grandma, she was still alive. Um, it was maybe 86, that was the last time. And that, there as well, there is some interesting, you know, flashbacks that I have that I have in my mind of crossing the border from Burundi to Rwanda. We were young; we were probably uh, six, ten, etc. But I remember spending hours and hours at the border, and we would have a driver who was neither Rwandan or Burundian yeah. negotiate for us children to come and be able to visit our grandma, our uncles, aunts, cousins that, you know, had the privilege of being born there. It wasn't straightforward. You wouldn't just get there, present whatever documents you have and just stamped in. No. It was a whole process and needed negotiation. Hours of waiting at the border. I can visualize, I can remember exactly where, you know, I would see the driver who had, a, you know, another mm -hmm. East African background uh, that would go for hours and negotiate at the customs and they will be in the car um, and then later on will be allowed to enter the promised land. <laughs> <laughs> So oh. sorry, I'm joking in a way because yeah. uh, it's it's part of our our yeah. history. Um, so once in the promised land, so we would then drive to Ruhango, spend maybe the uh, summer holidays for a month with our grandma. And, and you loved it. And you loved those she holidays. had the cows. We had a lot of cows. Uh, it, it's really a positive memory I had uh, yeah. there. And uh, the reason why I'm sharing this, it's connected mm. to your question. And the question is, how did it affect uh, you and me? So my grandmother, at that time in 94, she was, um, I think she was 72 or something like that. Very, she was very tiny, but very strong. She lost her husband, my grandfather, who used to work for the king, our last king. Um, in Nyanza, the court, he was a veterinarian, so he would basically look after our king's uh, uh, cows and yes. milk and approve before the king uh, would the drink. Milk. Yes. Right? So you would understand. So we heard all of those stories later that, you know, Grandfather Carrera, the name comes from my father and his okay. father. Mm. So we knew the connection, and of course, he. After 59, I think he passed away. Uh, he was poisoned. He was poisoned in uh, 60, 1960. So my grandfather stayed behind with many other uh, children, and she had to become basically uh, the head of the household. So when we would visit her in the 80s from abroad, because our father was not uh, after 59, when he learned in 60 that his dad passed away, mm -hmm. he never wanted to come back to Rwanda, so he stayed mm -hmm. behind. Uh, so, yes, we lost uh, very, very close family members. Mm -hmm. um, our cousin, our cousin, our oh, cousins, actually, oh, plural, wow. uncles. Uh, we heard stories, and I know some of our cousins had female cousins, unfortunately, experience some um, physical um, abuse yeah abuse they yeah. use that word i'm yeah. trying to find the, the 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 words which is something that has happened to many uh either genocide survivors or those that have not survived where there was that uh, physical abuse to young women mm -hmm. uh they were young we were same age at that time and um, some of them are no longer here mm -hmm. so in a nutshell i think uh, whether you were there yeah. physically but emotionally you were there yes because you can't escape it yeah mm. yeah in, in April 94 we were actually just in Burundi mm. and we went to Europe in June so we would see people come from Rwanda we would receive them oh. yeah. yeah so and they would tell those stories yeah mm. thank you for sharing that Mary when we come back we will be talking trauma, healing, wellness. We'll be going right into that zone where Mireille Carrera 
belongs. Thank you for staying with us. If you have a question, a thought, a suggestion, please use the hashtag The Real Talk and let us know what you're thinking. But also, since we are running on air and on YouTube, kindly share the link so that we have as many people as possible benefiting from this conversation. Thank you. Welcome back to The Real Talk. And as I said earlier, I would love to hear from you. Use the hashtag, The Real Talk. Mary and I will be online and we will respond to you. Now, Mary, I want to tap into the professional side okay. of Mary. Mm -hmm. I wonder, what impact does being close to or uh, mm -hmm. being part of something as traumatizing as the mm -hmm. genocide Mm. What impact does that have on somebody's mental well-being? Mm. Whether you are directly impacted or indirectly impacted. Yeah. Mm. There, is, there is a lot to cover mm. because um, it's a serious topic. It's a serious topic that many people have dedicated years and years of their lives to uh, not only research but also work towards healing. Um, you know, the areas of trauma. So I know this is an area beyond the coaching. So yes, in life coaching, we, mm -hmm. we talk about levels of satisfaction, understanding the blockages, what can hold you stuck. And the trauma is one of them. Um, the field of psychology that deals with trauma is mainly counseling. So you can be a coach and a counselor at the same time. So there are similar paths but can also diverge as well. So what we do as life coaches, of course, is study about psychology, how your brain functions and what causes your, your heart, your brain to function in a certain way. Um, so trauma, uh, negative emotions such as fear, which certainly is one of it, is something we must understand. It's something we, we need to understand when uh, someone comes to you and talks to you about their, their areas of being um, st stuck so that you have them to unstuck. So I, the way I will answer it is um, I brought my pops. Okay. Um, trauma can be something you are aware of or something you're not aware of. Remember I uh, talked about I wasn't even aware I had an issue with belonging, right? Mm. Uh, which is one of the core human needs. So belonging, love, connection. Um, because I had all of that with my immediate family and, of course, whatever community we had. But it could be something, they say trauma is a spectrum, right, like this. It's a spectrum where um, it could be acute, where you know it's 100% and it can affect your ability to be functional. So you will hear the term functional or not functional. So it's like a ruler. If you can imagine this ruler, I have it at uh, this level, right? Mm. So either you are aware of it or, or you're not. And sometimes that can be or there and you're not aware of it, or it can be acute, it can be dramatic. So you need to take action. Or it can be at 50%, or it can be at 25%, 10%. Or, you know, you don't even know that you don't know you have a problem. Mm. Um, so there are many levels of trauma. I think we I needed the audience to wow. be aware yeah. of when you talk about that very big, big T word, uh, it's not someone who is not functional, which is what people tend to think that, oh, you're traumatized and it becomes a stigma, it becomes an illness. Mm. Um, but then trauma can start where you're not aware of it. And you need to do that discovery to know uh, what is actually stopping me to do this and that. But relating to um, the Rwandan experience with 94, since you're, you're covering uh, the Quibok at 30, um, and my experience, over and above the country healing journey that has gone, um, you know, the, the nation has provided with the healing, reconciliation. There's definitely has been some healing mm -hmm. at the national level, at, um, you know, the macro level. 
But then, and, and that's a good thing, that we went through it as a nation to go through reconciliation, forgiveness, and many other programs that the government had. So I really applaud uh, all of the efforts of people who really created a space for reconciliation, unification. So that was very key in the 90s. Uh, and of course, you know, up until now, I don't think we are aware, yeah. we can safely say, you know, we are good. It's mm -hmm. continuous. It's an effort we have to all of us work on. Now, that's at the macro level. But at the micro level, at the individual level, of course, um, there's a lot that needs to be done still. Um, where in my line of work, uh, as a coach, we yes, we are life coaches, business coaches, leadership coaches. So I coach people in different settings, in groups, but also individually where I sit like we are sitting. And uh, they may be coming to our organization maybe for a specific business issue for someone's leadership. But then there is an issue connected to that hidden trauma. Mm -hmm. That issue that is connected, maybe I don't know how, uh, I've not processed the fact that I lost my father in 94 and I saw it. I lost my mother and I saw it and it has caused me to behave this way, to feel um, you know, not worthy or not even shine when I need to. I don't, you know, I feel guilty in a way that I'm alive. I'm um, struggling I'm, to forgive. Yes, forgive. Oh, that's a big thing, forgiveness. So I will, can maybe share about forgiveness in a moment, but mm. specific to post-genocide, um, I think there has been a healing. We need to acknowledge that, and I'm grateful that we are, we are healed as a nation. We are reconciled, so mm. praise God for that. Yeah. But what I'm alluding to is that there is still that individual work that I, I believe be your audience will need to remember that it's on you mm -hmm. to, um, yeah, to get well. Mm -hmm. So the, the impact is broad. We can go into different directions, um, whether it's at the professional level or in uh, family, friends level. Yes, it is a good thing that we have uh, Kwibuka because mm -hmm. in a way as a nation, we, we are grateful that we have passed that phase, but then at the same time, the word Kwibuka says remembering, uh, that it should never happen again, yeah. so that never again is, is a good thing. Um, so there are so many stories I can tell you, you Jackie, about... Talk about forgiveness. About forgiveness? Talk about forgiveness, Ooh. yeah. Oof. Can I share a story about me? Please do. Yeah, yeah. and hopefully someone following us will uh, will be free and will uh, forgive because forgiveness is one of the most powerful weapons we have, positive weapons to healing oh. in a positive way. So as in weapons of deliverance for your soul. Mm. So I'm speaking from a soul's perspective. Um, yes, when things such as, you know, geopolitical situations happen, um, you don't have any control, right? It's by force. It's by force, as we said. But then there is the choice. So healing is by choice. Um, yes, violence is by force, but healing is by choice. Um, but in our daily lives also, uh, it's a choice for you to forgive. It's a choice for you to forgive because you are the one benefiting, not the perpetrator. Yes, it's bad enough, it's awful when something happens to you um, and, it, and you have no control over it. However, for you to be free, for you to be able to thrive as a human being, as a business person, as whatever your category is, you have that choice to make. Um, I remember I, what I teach, I have gone through it myself, so I'm teaching out of experience so it's not just a concept and big words we hear there i remember um some time back where someone did something awful awful um in the sense that i was disappointed i was hurt yet i had done good for for them uh, i've been there for them i've helped them grow in whatever they wanted me to grow and the thing is, whenever I would hear about that person's name or the thought of that person's name come to mind, 
I would be triggered. I would be triggered and I would rehearse some really negative uh, thought about them. And that's very common, whether we're talking about a war situation or relationship, a husband, wife, uh, yes, brother, sister, a family, friends. So this is a really a general message for everybody mm. because it's the same. So back to my story, um, I, because I've gone through also myself some counseling, I've gone through some counseling um, in the past and, um, and because of that I got to learn about the power, power of healing through forgiveness. So one day I realized that enough is enough. This person is living rent free in my head. <laughs> this person is living rent free in my heart. So I need to make sure that that rent is severed, whatever that was. Um, so one day I just uh, picked up the call and, um, and uh, went and asked for a meeting, went to see the person and uh, I just really openly talked to them about what, what I felt and also how I forgive, how beyond that, this is going to be a challenge to anyone listening to me, mm. beyond that really is bless them. You oh. speak a blessing. That's why I said it was a weapon because it's a spirituality. Uh, beyond you know, business coaching is spirituality. You overcome evil with good. Yeah. Light overcomes darkness by being light. So you overcome evil with good. So whatever that was, whether I was hurt, that person did really wrong, disappointed me, um, I just went in there because I had done work on myself. This is where, whether you are in a trauma situation or you want to achieve something in your life, you must make a choice that you won't stay where you are. Mm -hmm. You must go through that discovery journey of finding out is there any hidden trauma? Is there anything hindering me? So I have done that journey where I, I realize, okay, there is a tape in my head about this person. So clearly I need to free myself from it. Yeah, so went there, met the person, um, and then we, um, we cleared the air. Mm -hmm. But the result of it, which is I hope is going to be an incentive, is that so many blessings opened up from oh, that. After that. Financial blessings. Uh, opportunities because what you don't realize is that you you hold yourself back and um, and you you are the one hurting yourself so for me I was like okay I'm a spiritual person I'm a woman of faith mm. so I believe in that uh, forgive those who have hurt you forgive your debtors as you also have debts so for me uh, as a Christian, that's something I, I know it's a, it's a must and it's a lifestyle I want to have. So after going through it, mm. um, you know, it became easy. <laughs> uh, I saw benefit in that because yes, I was free. Yes, I was healed. And also the other person was freed as well. The other person was freed. I know in with the Gachacha court, now back to Rwanda, yeah. um, that that was really, in my personal view, I think that's one of the main reasons why Rwanda is shining. Yes, we can talk about innovation. Yes, we can talk about, you know, how far we are. But at the core of it spiritually, because we have done the hardest thing as a nation to reconcile and ask each other forgiveness, which is really hard. It's not easy. But once you have done that, you are free, you are blessed, and look at so the, the Gachacha courts. That was the foundation. That, for me, at the macro level, was a big foundation yeah. for many things, many blessings for the nation. Mm -hmm. So the finishing on that uh, for your audience, I think, try to practice forgiveness. Try to do it. It will be difficult. Um, if you're holding unforgiveness, actually you, you are holding yourself. The other person is also held up in a way. Um, so what I have done from that, oh my goodness, I became like a forgiveness machine. <laughs> if, 
I mean, it's easy. It's easy to say it, but of course, depending on the hurt, though, mm. I should not minimize the, the hurts. Depending on the hurts, depending on the pain, depending on the level of trauma, remember the tape, mm. you know, whether it's at the 100% level where you are functional or not functional, it is a journey. It's a journey. It is a journey, but you need to know you must be on the journey mm. if you wish, if you wish to move forward in your life. Forgiveness is not an option. Mm. Forgiveness is a must. Your blessings are held because of unforgiveness. So release the person and everyone is going to win. So once somebody starts on that journey of mm. healing, mm -hmm. as a coach, what would you recommend as uh, practices for mm. them to maintain yeah. in order not to relapse? Oh, I love that. So you have to start somewhere. So step one is uh, acknowledge that you have a problem. So it goes from that unconscious uh, stage to being aware, to being conscious. So first step, realize that there is a problem and also make sure that you talk about it. So the first step to, for, to healing is addressing, acknowledging that you have a problem. You may know it, but you won't acknowledge, you won't tell your best friend, you won't tell your colleague, you won't tell your partner that I have been struggling with this. I have been struggling with, I don't know, unforgiveness or I made a mistake, I feel guilty or I, you know, yeah. I, I, I'm mad at myself. I'm struggling with guilt at the moment, but mm. I rarely talk about it, you know. Mm. I have this guilt, I lost my mom in 2021 and I am mm. struggling with that so much. But mm. I don't get to talk to people about it. My sister, my brothers, they don't know what I am going through. I have chosen to, I keep saying dealing with it on my own, but I feel like it's taking longer. Probably after this session, you and I will need to sit and have a one-on-one -on -one for my sake. Your healing journey started today because you've just spoken about it. Amen. You've just spoken about it. Yeah. So number one is acknowledging that uh, you have that problem. And I, I congratulate you for being brave mm -hmm. and strong to uh, share that big thing, uh, you know, with, uh, with the audience. Mm -hmm. And I know now your siblings will know how you feel. So, yes, yeah, step one, acknowledge there's a problem. Awesome. Step two, um, ask for help. Ask for help. Speak to someone. Speak to someone. But choose who you're going to speak to, someone who can help. So yes, you ask for help, but who can help? It has to be someone who's competent, who's qualified. Uh, it, if it has to do with trauma, make sure you speak to a psychologist, someone who's licensed, who is experienced, uh, or a life coach, or a pastor, uh, or a priest, someone really who has that calling and uh, ability to help you. Because mm -hmm. not everyone you will talk to will be able to help. In fact, they can take you to that relapse you were talking oh. about. So be intelligent about who to ask for help. And uh, once you've done that, open up, open up, speak, 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 speak. There is power in speaking. There is power in just sharing. So whatever that was hidden in your subconscious mind comes out as you speak. You don't even know what you are saying, but there is value in just sharing so that one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversation you will have will definitely get you to realize even more hindrances and, of course, opportunities available to you. Mm -hmm. So acknowledge you have a problem, go seek for help, get help, and now the third will be uh, do your part, act, work, work on it, because it will be a difficult journey, oh. but a good one, necessity. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so be... Right work on that, mm -hmm. make sure that you create small goals. If the issue is unforgiveness like I had, I made sure that I must go and speak to the person. And later on, I would call everyone, even former, you know, for relationships. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, remember, <laughs> you promised this, you promised right. this, you proposed, yeah. you didn't do it. I was, uh, felt like it was okay, but later on, I realized that this had, was the impact. So I literally went back to the list of people. I wrote down, write down a list of people when you think about them, oh, you feel like that. Like it you are mean, cringing. It doesn't matter the degree, 
to which you feel that way. So as you said earlier, don't minimize it. Huh? Don't minimize because uh. if you're thinking of a person and then you feel, <laughs> then something this, is yeah. there, okay? Something is there. So maybe start with the, before you ask for help, just write down, if it is mm. unforgiveness specifically, write down who they are. Either you go and speak with them or just acknowledge it with, within mm. yourself without speaking to them. Mm. And you release them to say, uh, I don't know, John, I forgive you. Jane, I forgive you. Manzi, I forgive you. They can either be there or not. It's better if yeah. you can actually do that because your, your soul is going to be free from that. So act yeah. mm -hmm. on that and where possible have someone be accountable, like your accountability partner. When it comes to coaching, when it comes to counseling, you need to have someone that actually can help you become accountable. It's not a journey to walk alone. Kavisa, it's not for you alone. Okay. It's not meant to be for you alone. Yeah. You need a community. You need, yes, experts. You need people who understand um, you know, how to give care, whether it's pastoral care mm. or psychological care or self-care with the coach. Um, you know, have someone that will challenge you even and say, Jackie, did you speak to yeah. your siblings about how you yeah. feel guilty, right? Uh, yes, no, negotiate and, you know, because the, it will be a back and forth. There will be times where you are up, down, sideways, mm. forward, backward. That's okay. That's your journey. That's okay. Um, you're not supposed to heal the same way as the next person. Yeah. Just be yourself in your healing journey. Be who you are. And when you have the right person supporting you, serving you along that journey, um, it will be a win-win for all. Wow. So that accountability, and the next thing is um, celebrate. Celebrate when you have achieved that. Wow. Celebrate um, and uh, because you have achieved something that is big. It is, you know, they say healing, actually let me go with the trauma. Trauma can be mental, it can be physical. The actual definition of the word trauma according to uh, some of the dictionaries I've consulted. So trauma is an injury. It's a mental injury, it's a physical, physical injury. injury. Yeah. So that means you heal mentally, your mind, your heart, your soul, and also physically. Because if you don't, you can actually have issues such as you know, cancer. They attribute some of the cancers to unforgiveness, bitterness, resilience, because your whatever happens in your body, I'm not a doctor uh, as a disclaimer, but it does affect you in your internal organs. So it is in your interest to heal, to work on those steps I've just shared. But once you've Thank done you that, so much for that, celebrate. Yeah. Talk to someone about it. The last one, arguably the last step to recovery is sharing your story. So mm -hmm. tell your testimony, because you not only affirm your healing, but you also affirm others. Because wow. I'm believing that whoever is going to watch this will connect and also share their stories of struggle and also empower others. So that's how you heal, one person at a time, through a systematic approach that, yes, if you can afford to have someone walk that journey with you, by all means, seek professional guidance. But also, I know that you know whether it's at a church or in the communities, there will always be an elder that is there to walk that journey with you. But once you're healed, come back and tell the story. Testify. That's right. Before we look at six cues, as we mark Kwibuka mm Tati, -hmm. if you're given an opportunity to share a message mm -hmm. to the survivors, share a message, Mm -hmm. the current generation and future generation about mm -hmm. forgiveness, resilience, well-being, what message would that be? Mm -hmm. Wow. So I'm given an opportunity to speak to someone about yeah. healing. Um, because it's Kwibuka, what happened in the past is regrettable and uh, that's something I do not wish any other generation to experience. And everyone watching us has a part in responsibility, ensuring that it doesn't happen. Um, over and above that, my life's message is to make sure that you discover who you are, your greatness, 
And your greatness cannot come out if you don't uh, overcome trauma, if you don't overcome whatever barriers or things that are causing you to be stuck. So healing from the past, yes, it's difficult. Yes, it's very painful, uh, but make it a choice. What happened in the past was by force. You didn't have a choice. I didn't have a choice to uh, never be a Rwandan as I was born. And I only returned in 2014. Literally, we started Cora um, only about 10 years ago. So that's what I can say. I lived in the country I was born to be. So by force, life happens. We may not um, have a choice on that. But if you are alive, you are breathing, you have a choice. You have a choice to make it work for you. Um, and be decisive. Be decisive to discover who you are as the greatest individual that you are. Every human being here is there to add value, to create an impact. But it starts with you knowing that you belong in this earth, you belong that belonging, mm -hmm. you belong in this earth, but you belong as a, someone who adds mm -hmm. value, someone who creates, someone who is there to co-create with the creator. So you can only do that when you discover your gifts, your talents, your purpose. Can I challenge you, all of you watching, to know all of that, what you are the best at, what you are doing better than anybody, because there is something you are here to do that I can't do, that Jackie cannot do, that once you discover that, then you are good. Even when trouble comes, even when you know geopolitical issues happen, financial challenges, you know for sure you are on point, you know for sure that you cannot fail. That will happen once you determine that you will win. You determine at the end of your life, you will be pleased that you have lived the life that you were born to live. That's powerful. Thank you. That was a coaching moment right there. We will be right back with six cues as we edge towards the end of the conversation. I am so touched and I have learned a lot from this time that I've spent with Mireille. And my prayer is that this show has spoken to you yeah. and your particular need. There's a reason why you ended up watching the show today and we do hope that it's worth your while. We're yeah. coming to you from Mythos Boutique Hotel in Kiovu. They do have the corporate lunch served every weekday. You should check on them. You will love them. On Twitter, they are Hotel Mythos, at Hotel Mythos. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Let's get Mireille's six cues. Mireille, your favorite hobby. Mm. The one that helps you unwind. Writing. Journaling. <sighs> Journaling. Journaling, yeah. Great. Question number two. What book has had a significant impact on you? I have two books. Mm -hmm. Dictionary. <laughs> I, I know. I okay. read the dictionary. And the Bible. Because the Bible has 66 books in it. And it has wisdom. Yeah. yeah. It has wisdom. Um, you know, you you know somebody would have picked somebody's autobiography or Well, we have 66 autobiographies book. in there. Oh, the Bible so, is it, like the mother of all autobiographies. In terms of leadership for me, it helps me. Okay. Uh, for example, if I whiz through in my head quickly about, you know, the story of Moses. So I get to read about how a leader was imperfect, but was used by God to bring out many people out of exile. Mm -hmm refugees, hello, mm -hmm. in uh, Egypt, into yeah. uh, Israel. Israel. So for me, I look at the character, the leadership style, uh, but also mm -hmm. I learned that, you know, I, no one has to be perfect to be effective. Great. Yeah, so that is one, one of the reasons yeah. uh, in terms of why it is impactful for me. So I get it now. Yeah. 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 My next question is, if, do you have a specific place that you go to seeking inspiration or peace? A physical place? Yes, a physical place that you go to. You're looking for peace. You're looking for inspiration. Yeah. Do you have Kibuye. it? Kibuye. Kibuye oh. is, uh, okay, Karongi. Nowadays, mm. Karongi is one uh, for me. Mm. It's, it's quiet. It's mm. peaceful. It's by the lake. It's Actually, any by the lake. Very beautiful oh, as well. It's amazing. Yeah. And my fourth question, is there a song or an artist that you'd listen to over and over? <laughs> 
so funny. Last week there was a there was a song I was listening to in the car over and over. So I was literally driving my driver nuts <laughs> last week. <laughs> like, rewind, rewind. And no, it was an auto, so and of course on the speaker because I discovered that song. So uh, Israel Mbonyi. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's he's wonderful. Oh, he's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So I, I had discovered a song he sang, I think, a year or two years ago. Mm. Oh. Yeah. I discovered that just a week or just two weeks day. ago. And then every day from work to home, from home to work, I was You go like, looking for that message. Yes, na -na -na -na. it's a beautiful yeah. one. <laughs> Brilliant artist. He is. I'll have him on the show one of these days. Mm. And then uh, do you have a morning routine that you stick to? Yeah, I do, and it's important to have a morning routine um, before you start the day. And as they say, you know, you need to fill your cup before you pour out into others. So your cup mm -hmm. has got to be full. So my habit is uh, prayer and meditation in the morning. Uh, I, I can't open my eyes without praying. So oh. I give, you know, honor to my creator, um, and then, of course, seek guidance for the day. Um, and then I meditate. Uh, I, I journal in the morning. I, I record what I believe um, is what I've done in the previous in the previous day. So it helps me. It helps okay. me to be grounded before I get to solving anyone's problem and, of course, dealing with work-related matters. So uh, I would recommend that you know you find whatever rhythm is for you to have a me time. Yeah, um, so start off the day. Oh, it's important because mm. it keeps you grounded when you know situations happen when you manage business or you help your clients manage business for me as a coach i must be mentally stable um before i help anybody else so Absolutely. my cup has to be full before and you then and i pour, pour out into someone's if cup. it is empty that means i need to be refreshed and yeah. i know now that uh when i need to refresh and refill there is somewhere i need to go and uh and uh, yeah, and be refreshed. And lastly, do you have a favorite quote that guides you? Yes, it's a quote that I have written. Great. It's a quote that I have written. It says, uh, whether understood or misunderstood, where you stood, be the one who outstood. Whether understood or misunderstood, where you, you stood, stood be, be the, the one, one who, who outstood. outstood. So basically it means whether people understand you, or people misunderstand you, keep standing, stand, stand, stand. and stand out. So I, I had some po poetic license with the outstood part where, because it means two things, to stand out as in you shine, but also you outstand the sense that you, you, you stand out, you outstand the issue long enough for you to win. So Amazing. I hope it helps. Thank you for that. As we wrap up, you came, up, you came over with two props and only used the tape measure. What were those for? Right. Are we going to do makeup? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. So the props, I think this one we covered. That one we covered? Of, yeah. yeah. So this was... The um, buds, the cotton. The cotton is, buds yes. to display how it is important for you to go through a journey of healing. Mm -hmm. So imagine these are your emotions. And this is you, this is your brain, this is your mind, this is your physical body. So if you have gone through trauma, that is maybe the size of your trauma, and um, depending on whether it is a small trauma, right, mm -hmm. um, that's okay, yeah. right? So you, you can function a little bit. But if you don't work on it, I know we'll clean up. Yeah, we will. Um, it can get to a point where you're no longer functional and you know the use of your body your mind and your soul everything is leaking into every area of your life so make sure that you remain you remain stable you remain you make sure that your cup actually needs to be empty in terms of negative emotions so that you remain dry and ready to function so that is why I brought it here to give a visual as to don't be at the point where it's all leaking in every area of your life. Make a choice to be healed today. What a pleasure it has been to have this conversation with Mireille Carrera. I am out of words. I will leave it up to you 
watch the program, re-watch it as many times as you want. Pick your message. I have no doubt there's something for you. And there could be something for a friend, a family member, sibling. Yeah. Share with them the link. Let us all get that message that this episode intended for us. My name is Jackie Dumbasi, our guest, Maria Carrera of Cora Coaching and Business Academy. Mm -hmm. It has been such a pleasure to hear from her. Thank you for making time for us, Mireille. Thank you for having me. It was very good. And I you so commend you for being yeah. brave to share your story. I can't My wait pleasure. to hear the celebration. the celebration. We give God the glory. Amen. Thank you. We will see you again next week. God bless you.